interior. Abdominal wall. That's what I'm presenting this morning. The last muscles on your uh, study list. As a, as a muscle group, they form three layers of thin muscles. So um, what I did was I made a section through the model on the app. And so if you kind of look at the cross-section of you can see those three layers. I highlighted the outermost layer that I want you to see of the three layers. So it starts here, <coughs> and it just kind of goes all the way out there. So that layer, that's the outermost layer, is the external oblique. The full name is external abdominal oblique. Outermost layer. All right, so notice that um, the muscle is actually more lateral. It's out here. Cut the color in a little bit. And medially, it's not muscle. It's a whitish colored um, connective tissue called the aponeurosis. So I'm just running muscle parts more lateral. And the medial part is connective tissue. Called um, aponeurosis. It's connective tissue. Um, muscle layer directly beneath the external oblique is the internal oblique. So I have a highlighted there. Okay, so this layer is um, the same as external oblique in that the muscle fibers, I don't know if you can see it on this tattoo, right? They're out here. Here are the muscle fibers out there. And um, what you can see is that this layer, the uh, internal abdominal oblique, internal. has something called the rectus sheath. The 
which is this little compartment right here. Because in there is a muscle group, your abs, which we call your abs. It's rectus abdominis. Your six pack, really it's an eight pack, but we highlight it. Okay, that is rectus abdominis sheathed inside the connective tissue layers of internal oblique. So the, um, just the other color here, I guess. Come off blue. Okay, so that's kind of that. Now, the deepest layer is the transversus abdominis. I just use black. It's right here. Again, the muscle fibers of that layer, they run in the transverse plane there. Anyways, but that's, that's another layer. Transversus abdominis. that part of the external layer? No, it's its own layer. <laughs> so there's three layers. Um, and I'll describe the transversus abdominis as the deepest layer. So in terms of layers, consider the external abdominal oblique, layer number one. An intermediate layer, layer number two, is pretty much both of those. The internal oblique and rectus abdominis and transversus abdominis is its own third and deepest layer. And the reason why it's called that, transversus, is um, in the transverse plane, the, the, the direction of the fibers Right in the transverse plane. <coughs> so, okay, let me give you a page number for the layering if uh, the drawing isn't. Category is anterior abdominal wall. Yeah, there's a good picture on 154. Cross sectional view. to uh, the atlas. Now, it helps to look at this um, without the layers, just like this. Let me get rid of the cutting tool. So I have all the layers on. Actually, let me add one more layer. So that's all the layers. But if I remove the outermost layer and just highlight the external abdominal oblique and isolate it, that's kind of what it looks like by itself. Just a flash sheet. And if you remove that layer, there's the internal abdominal oblique. Just isolate it. all the way to the back side there. And then if I remove that layer, you can see how the rectus abdominis, you see how it's contained in that little pocket? That's the rectus sheath. 
Okay, that is why we kind of viewed the rectus abdominis inside there. And if you isolate it, we call it a six pack. But really, there, there would be eight. Here's half of it, here's four. And the rectus abdominis has the distinction of being the only segmented muscle. Segmented. The pax. There's these intertendinous connections between the packs of muscle. Okay. And as we can see, it goes all the way up to your chest. That is rib five. Okay, that's usually the pack you don't see because it's on the stiff rib cage, and so it can't really contract that much. Uh, but it's there in the pectoral region. All the way goes all the way up there. Anyways, rectus abdominis, and then even deep to that is the transversus abdominis, whose um, fibers run in the transverse plane. They run straight in the horizontal. And I think for the ab wall, I'm going to keep it simple. Don't worry about attachments or innervation. Just be able to identify it. Just be able to ID and action. They flex trunk. Trunk flexion, bending forward. I think that's easy enough to understand. I, I could get really fancy with it and talk about other things, but. Basic, the basic idea is trunk flexion, you just bend forward. That's all I had to uh, really know for the, uh, the interior abdominal wall. So let's kind of draw it out using the coloring book. <coughs> First one listed on your study list is the rectus abdominis, and I list it in the region that is called anterior abdominal wall. <coughs> to be more specific, <coughs> anterior abdominal wall. Sometimes it's called anteromedial. Anteromedial. abdominal wall because it's right in the middle. So this is the region where we have rectus abdominis. So this is T12, we wrote that in. T5 is really all the way up here. So this muscle group, it actually goes, attaches all the way up here. And it's gonna run all the way down. Around there. And before I draw it further, I, I wanna draw in uh, a center line that's a connective tissue seam called the uh, linea alba. <coughs> linea alba is spelled. Linea alba. Think of it as, it's described as a raphe, which is basically, think of like sewing, and you stitch. It's a seam. 
and all the layers kind of stitch into it and are connected to there. Uh, CT, quote unquote, C. All ab wall muscles connect there. So let me draw it as um, going from xiphoid process to pubic synthesis, right here. So that would be the linear alpha. As a frame of reference, navel, right there, belly button. Now I'm going to finish drawing uh, rectus of pelvis. And don't forget um, to draw. Um, the actual segments. Let's see. First segment is usually around here. Second one usually around there. And then another one and another one. So each of these A little pack, and I drew the fibers up and down because they run vertically. Okay, so that's half of it. So let's draw the other half. So if you go external to that, from medial to lateral, you have what's called the anterolateral abdominal wall. So it's in the front, but on the sides. So the anterior abdominal wall starts with the outermost layer the external oblique. Let's remember that the rectus abdominis is in the rectus sheath and it's kind of that intermediate layer. So the external abdominal oblique I'll do first as a part of anterolateral external. Abdominal That also goes all the way up to rib five, which is around here. Just kind of attached all along the rib cage there, so you run all the way down to the um, iliac bone, and then go kind of medially. And always draw linea alba. Right down the middle. Sides. Now I'm going to draw just a line right around there, right kind of by the costal margin there. Because medially, remember, it's not muscle, it's connective tissue. Remember what we called it? Pretty much from here to here. 
aponeurosis. Okay, so let me label some of these. We call the center line linea alba. Or we call it from there to there aponeurosis, which is connective tissue, not muscle. The muscle part is on the sides there. And the external oblique, the fibrous are oblique, is like if you put your hands in your pockets, the direction of my fingers approximates how the fibers run that direction, kind of like this. Okay, that's the external abdominal oblique. And then the layer deep to that is the internal abdominal oblique. Internal. Abdominal oblique. That layer is a little different. It just kind of follows the costal margin here. But I'm going to start off. I'll start with my linear Start there. distance down to the hip. It's going to go medially like that. So one thing we notice is um, right down the middle your abdomen is really wide, but because it follows the costal margin, on the sides, the abdomen is really short. It's only like this big, okay, but it's really wide in the front. And it's the same thing. You're going to have the aponeurosis in the middle. And the fibers for the internal abdominal oblique, they kind of they kind of fan out, okay? So fibers down here run down, and as you get more towards the navel, and they kind of run horizontally, and then they fan up. Like that. The fibers are, are a good clue to kind of know what layer you're looking at. I always look for that. And I'll show you on the cadaver today, for those of you who will attend. So the deepest layer, transverse is abdominis. Fiber direction. The fiber direction. Yeah, if you can't see the layers for whatever reason, you should be able to see the layers. Uh, fibers are also. fibers went straight across in the transverse plane. <coughs> and it's the deepest layer. The last one is transversus abdominis.
that's the front. You also have a posterior abdominal wall. And there's actually four muscles down there, but I really want you to know one muscle back there that's kind of two. It's called the um, iliopsoas. Okay. Iliopsoas. All right, so that's the deepest layer highlighted in transversus abdominis. I'm going to remove that layer so we can see behind it. Boom. And posteriorly, I see some muscles there. Let me highlight one of them. Okay, then that's the psoas major. The muscle I want you to know is called iliopsoas, and part of that muscle is psoas major, how it's highlighted. So let me uh, right on board. P is silent, so don't say iliopsis, it's iliopsoas. And it, it, it's basically two muscles, the psoas major and the iliacus. Two muscles in one. And since I do expect you to identify which of the two, uh, that's psoas major, what's highlighted. There is a psoas minor, but it's not on your study list. Don't worry about it. And iliacus. And that name should sound familiar, right? Let me highlight iliacus muscle. Isolated. I mean, what bone is it attached to? The iliac bone. So that, that kind of tells you that story. And um, well, let's go through the attachments. The psoas major, it's um, originating from, if you count up, it's all the way up to T12. Okay, this is L5, 4, 3, 2, 1, T12. Okay. And it's going to come all the way down here, and these two muscles are going to merge uh, and insert on the lesser trochanter. So, so for both of these, well, actually, just for so as major, the origin is on transverse processes and vertebral bodies of transverse processes and vertebral bodies. Of T12 to L5. The iliacus muscle is originating on the iliac fossa. Okay, so two different origins, but they will both insert on lesser trochanter.
The innervation is, um, don't worry about it, because one of them I didn't teach. Um, but I do want you to know the action. Okay, so kind of look how it crosses the hip. It can move the hip joint. So it's pulling from the front, it can flex hip. This is your major hip flexor. That's what they call this muscle. Major hip flexor. Thigh up, that's hip flexion. So I put two plates here, one for psoas major, one for iliacus. The iliacus muscle. Uh, it's always major first, since it's listed first there. T12. I'm going to put little dots on the um, transverse processes. And then on the vertebral bodies. But not on the last L5, I, I haven't seen a, an attachment there, um, but basically, that's it. Let's see here. I'm going to draw a muscle that goes all the way down to the trochanter there. That's pretty much so as major. It's inserting on this spot down here. That's your trochanter. And the same thing for iliacus right here. Inserts on uh, the lesser trochanter. <laughs> it's going to originate on iliac fossa all along here. Pretty much. It's going to go from iliac fossa to uh, a lesser trochanter. So think of those as two muscles in one, the iliopsoas. So you have to kind of watch where I label it. When the muscles um, come together, and you can't tell what's what, say I label it down here, close to the insertion. You can't tell, well, I can't tell if it's one or the other, then put iliopsoas, because that's what I'm going for. But if I label it up here, you can tell what it is, right? It's iliacus, if I label it close to the spine here, it's um, psoas major, so just kind of pay attention, pay attention to that. And that is the posterior abdominal wall, a couple of hip flexor muscles. So follow the origins? Yeah. Okay. Look at the origin. It's somewhere, don't I? Yeah. Yeah. And I think that'll be your clue. Okay, well, let's see. That's hip for muscles. I did have some clinical things I want you to look at.
the clinical problems I have listed, there's not too many. Um, but this one is a picture from the Atlas. It was actually on a Roubaix's quiz. That's the, that's what you see there is a rupture of this intracapsular ligament right there. That's the ACL. Okay. So when the ACL ruptures, say in an athlete or, so, or anybody, put a question mark because you don't know and you can't see that inside the person's knee until you do an MRI to confirm but right when the injury happens and you're assessing um, what test could you do okay um, hopefully if you're a trainer you're on the field maybe you saw it happen you can kind of deduce or if you didn't see it happen you have to do all these tests again if you take go be a trainer you take your classes get your certification but just in terms of the anatomy um, you can understand it if you understand that this ligament, it prevents anterior displacement of the leg. The ACL prevents anterior displacement of the leg. So if it's ruptured, you might be able to pull or draw the leg forward. So if you plant the person's foot in the ground, and then you pull from here, if you can move it forward a little more than usual, you see some laxity there, uh, that's a positive test that may indicate that this is ruptured. And an MRI may confirm the next day. They usually wait the day because you got to wait for the swelling to go down. You do the MRI. If you just see the swelling, you can't see anything. You have to wait for the swelling to go down, and then you can kind of see if there's any structural damage in there. Um, so I wanted to show you a little YouTube clip of that positive test. Um, I noticed that the clips that I embedded didn't work on this computer, so I went to YouTube there. This guy gives a few tests. Um, the test that I want you to know is called the anterior drawer test. And I noticed my page number was kind of out of date. 432, does it? I think it's 435. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, page 435. Thank you. Draw the sign test. This is where they can't move laterally. Um, this is when they can't, well, can't move what? Can't move laterally when they tear the ACL. Um, usually, if the ACL is torn, yes, you can't make those quick cuts from okay. side to side. Okay. You can usually run straight forward, but yeah, you're right. You are correct. Okay. All right. Let's see. ACL keeps the tibia. The anterior cruciate ligament or ACL keeps the tibia from gliding too far forward in relation to the femur. ACL tears result in knee instability. Various tests have been used to test knees for ACL tears. Can I start over and turn the lights off? The anterior cruciate ligament, or ACL, keeps the tibia from gliding too far forward in relation to the femur. ACL tears result in knee instability. Various tests have been used to test knees for ACL tears. The anterior drawer test is performed with the knee bent to about 90 degrees. The tibia is pulled forward. If there is no solid endpoint, or if the tibia moves too far forward, the test indicates that the ACL is torn.
the Lachman test is considered to be more reliable than the anterior drawer test. This is performed with the knee in about 20 to 30 degrees of flexion. Again, the tibia is pulled forward and again, too much movement or a soft, lax endpoint suggests an ACL tear. The pivot shift test is also commonly used to assess the ACL. This test is often difficult to do while the patient is awake because of guarding. The knee is held in extension. A varus force is applied while the leg is internally rotated and flexed. A clunk at about 20 to 30 degrees occurs with ACL tears. Yeah. That's the next one. Hold on. So your question is, how is it better now? Yeah, like, do, you, do they use different to repair that? Do they I don't know. Oh. You have to talk to us for Yeah. yeah. I, I know that the orthosco orthoscopic techniques make it really time better, but I'm not sure if the techniques have improved uh, over the years. Yeah. yeah, it's a good question, though. All right. Uh, the next one was... Uh, uh, Dellenberg's gate. <coughs> Let's see here. <laughs> All right, so um, this is a damage of a nerve that innervates gluteus medius and gluteus minimus. That would be the superior gluteal nerve. Maybe there's some nerve compression in the vertebra down there on the lumbar region. If that nerve doesn't work and you're unable to use the small what, what's called the small gluteal muscles, so that would be gluteus medius and gluteus minimus. They're ineffective, these muscles, because the nerve that innervates them isn't working well. So you'd see some weakness. The way you can observe it is um, if that's all that's not working and everything distal is okay, um, well, what you would see is a, a pelvis sag. So when they walk, that's gait means walking. When they walk, the pelvis sags during the swing phase. Pelvis sag on opposite side. During what's called the swing phase of your gait. Remember that um, battery works, okay. If the weakness is on the, the right, you cannot keep um, the pelvis horizontal, so it may sag, okay, if it's the middle one. So if they kind of lurch to one side, they're shifting their center of gravity to help. Okay. Normally, the pelvis should remain in the horizontal because during the swing phase when it puts off the ground, contract to keep this from sagging as you see in the middle break.
so I thought I'd get a clip of that. Watch carefully because they have um, their clothes on, of course. Or, well, you know, the weakness is on this side. And I guess she feels the weakness on this side, which is why she has the cane on that side. But which side is going to sag? The other side. So I'm thinking, why doesn't he have a cane over here? Maybe she doesn't know this. Okay. Is it more common than older people? Um, or did that just happen to you? Well, it could. I would say yes because nerve compression problems in the lower lumbar region usually to old people. Okay. Older, elderly. Just gonna film you walk if that's okay, okay. just for educational purposes. No, no, it's good. Did you see it? Yeah. Okay, there needs to be new to look for it. It's not hard to spot. That's trimmed down for a few. Okay, the last one is foot drop with high stepage gain. So think about the anterior compartment of the leg. And I excuse you from extensor ex digitorum longus and extensor hallucis longus, but uh, well, for example, you have to know tibialis anterior. That is damage is the deep branch, deep fibular nerve, for whatever reason. You lose function of the muscles in that area of the leg. Now think about that. Think about foot. We had dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. And do we know what those terms mean? You lose dorsiflexion. Okay. If you lose dorsiflexion, you can't hold your foot up when you walk. It's going to drop. Okay. Kind of like wrist drop in uh, palsy. So um, if your foot drops because there's extensor is not working. Tibialis anterior can't extend or dorsiflex. Okay. And dorsiflex. Foot drops. Again, so to so, so keep from dragging your foot on the ground, like this. Toe 
screws do not clear ground during swing phase. So you can waddle, you can swing out. The example I'm going to show you is a high stepage gate where you kind of like overcompensate so your foot doesn't drag on the grass. I'll, I'll show you the guy doing it. Get the thing I right. right, did you see that? Yeah. Okay, I, I get, if you look for it, if you know what to look for, it's easy to understand, I think. Okay, that's that's the last one. Alright, so that concludes the material for lecture exam six. The exam will become available online online today after class. And available all the way through where you can look and see it, right? It's up, it's up, it's up there. Um, what, I, what I want to do is excuse those who are not participating in the cadaver dissection. That's fine. There's, there's no penalty against you. Um, for those of you who are participating, I do have to group you because I can only present to so many at a time. I can only fit so many around a gurney at one time so everyone can see. Um, as you're putting your things away, um, if you wouldn't mind, I don't mean to herd you like cattle, but I have to know who's participating, and I need to group you. Um, can we... I don't, I don't know what I'm going to do here. Uh, okay. single file line right here. <laughs> you can line up like you're standing in line for right at Disney World. One, two, three, starting with you. Oh, by the way, all groups, 
I have the cadaver rolled out next door in room 418. You guys know where that is? It's on the other side of the wall. Can't be that hard to find. Uh, we'll do uh, group one really soon, about uh, 8.40, 9 o'clock, 9.40. Those are the times to report. Go to group 418. I'll see you shortly, okay? Okay. Yeah. So if you want, you can take all your stuff because you won't be coming back. There is a PowerPoint that are on Canvas. Okay. They didn't work That's what I was thinking. On, That's on this, but they work on other computers. Oh, okay. All right. yeah. Thank you. If they don't work, let me know. I can post it. Okay. 